Quite often we hear the term that Black men are not serious about taking care of their families and specifically their children. I have a gentleman who just wrote a book called Prove Them Wrong. And I must tell you, this uh, book is not only incredible, but the gentleman behind it is very incredible. And he has a story as it relates to why he wanted to write this book. So I want you all to stay tuned for my interview with the incredible Mr. Andrew Minot. So Andrew, man, yes, welcome, sir. welcome to MVP TV, sir. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. Your book is just totally amazing. And as I shared with you, you. Uh, moments ago, the subject matter is very, very difficult for a lot of brothers who deal with the fact that their dads weren't in their life. And, and yep. it's funny because when I saw this title, I said, hmm, let me let me dig deep into it. And um, you hit on so many points, man. And 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 of course, you you have a take on how important that was for you being involved in your children's life as a single parent with uh being born and raised yeah. in, in Jamaica. So let's talk about that. I grew up basically in Jamaica. I lived with my grandparents. My father wasn't there, so my grandparents raised me. Um, my mom was there, but not really there like that. So my grandparents were the ones that really were hands-on with me on a day-to-day -day basis. I left, I migrated from Jamaica when I was 18, a couple years after I left high school. And the belief was my brother and I were going to meet my father in New York. That was the whole premise, only to understand it from him that we weren't going to live with him to change his lifestyle. And, you know, you're basically on your own. So you can go live in New Jersey and figure out your life from there. And as me at 18, I was like, it was a shell shock for me because up to that point, I've only seen my father maybe five, six times. So for him to come across me and say that to me was like, it was it was hard. It, it was difficult, especially me not knowing him and figure I was going to be there and we were going to get to know each other then. I had to prove him wrong and all, all the things that he, he promised and what he was supposed to have done and he never did. So basically the whole premise of this is make sure I never did what my father did. So whatever he did, I did the opposite. So, you know, especially the fact that I ended up being a single parent and had to figure things out. And I just knew that I had to be there for my kids, no matter what it was, no matter what the circumstances were. I knew I had to be there for my, my especially my sons, because it, it get lost in translation so many times, like fathers are deadbeat, especially like black fathers, we're deadbeat and we're not there for our kids and we, we, we just, hang on, we just want to get women pregnant and all that. So that stereotype, I had to break that. So I had to, I had to prove all the people wrong, the naysayers and the people that said that, especially like black fathers, we're not responsible, we're not there for kids, we're not there to do things the right way. So it was a it was a task to prove them wrong. So I had to do that. So let's talk about the absence of the father and how that emotional detachment creates problems for men moving forward and how it's almost impossible, as you stated, for a woman to be a dad. Let's talk about that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's never, and I always say no knocking women because I understand the dynamic, but I didn't even know that after I did this book, there's a statistics that says that 70% of black men or I guess men that um, end up in prison are direct correlation with a father not being in their lives or a mentor or a father figure or someone like that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's very prevalent out there that basically single mothers do a hell of a job, no, no doubt. But you still need that male figure to actually teach boys how to become men. So there's a lot of there's a lot of men that come up on a single mom and they come out fine. That's not a problem. But if you check their background, they always have like 
a stepdad, an uncle, a coach, or somebody in their lives that actually guide them along the way. You know, it's it's just one of those things that we we grow up. Sometimes we don't even know any better because we think that's just what it is. You know, I've I have friends that I've known since high school, and we talk to them, and a lot of a lot of us, I didn't even realize it growing up back then that. We didn't have a father in our lives. A friend of mine that I've known for over 40 years, he he said his mom always be cursing him out and saying, oh, you're just like your father. Just, and you, she, he was like, mom, but you're the one who laid with this man and had me. I had no arguments in you selecting this man. So how am I getting blamed for this right now that I'm just like him and I didn't know this man. You knew him and I'm the direct result of that. And that's just what it is. A lot of time, a lot of time, um, mothers get because of their bitterness towards the the father for their, their child. They take it out on that son. And I've I've spoken to a lot of people, a lot of friends, and it, it is true. Just being in a situation where a man that could have participated in my life chose not to. Yeah. Whatever the reason. And so when I saw the, the title of your book, Prove, Prove Him Wrong, <clears throat> it really resonated with me because my whole entire career for a long time was t- attached to proving them wrong. But honestly, there was <laughs> only one, one audience. That was my father. Yeah, your father, That's, yeah. That, that, you know, so no matter what I was able to accomplish or not, I was going to accomplish it or die trying. Right. And, and the aha moment for me was when my father passed away, ironically on my birthday. And wow. when I realized that I cannot continue to give this man power over my life, it's a struggle today in my late fifties to really move past it. So your book, spoke to me in a way that is very, very personal because I very rarely speak about this in, in public because it's that painful. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell yeah, us about I've, I've, I've never, yeah. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. Same thing. No, the same thing with me. I've, the things I wrote in this book, I've never spoke about. There are things in this book I've not spoken about in 30, 40 years, never. Um, incidents that took place that I never brought up. That's why it was so hard when I was doing like the read um, again with Angelo. I, I brought that I couldn't even go through it. It it brought back a lot of trauma, and I, and I can understand the same way you feel because when I remember all the things that I went through that could have been avoided, and ironically. I ended up taking care of my father the last four years of his life. It's so ironic. So he, all the neglect and everything that, and the doubt and the, the no encouragement that he gave me, the last four years of his life, I was one taking care of him, which he's never done for me. Never. Right. right. And came around full circle. So, you know, it's just one of those things. Again, um, this this is so impactful for me on so many different levels we're we're beyond trying to help you promote a book right that's that's part of the the business stuff that we got to do right but the spiritual and the emotional part of what you're doing man you need to you need to sell 10 million copies because i know i I, I know a lot of men who who deal with this and they don't talk about it publicly they they'll say it amongst our, our our small little group you know, um, I've, it, it, I'm, I'm surprised that I'm able to talk to you right now and not bust out in tears. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's difficult for me personally. And even when I tell you, man, we, when Angelo and I were like reading, I was like, I had to stop. And he was, I, I couldn't, I couldn't read certain parts of it. It's, it's, you get really, you get really deep for me. It does. I've never spoken about a lot of these things. So let's talk about the emotional part of it and how it creates emotional detachment for some of us. You know, like I grew up 
in the sense of men were not supposed to show their emotions. You know, like I've never ever remember my father ever telling me he loved me. Never. Same here. He has never. You know, so I never grew up in the sense of, and I get I get killed for this with my wife too, because she said I'm not emotional. I'm not. Um, I like that emotional aspect of my life in a sense of, and I, I agree with that a hundred percent, but it's the effect. And a lot of people don't understand that the way you were raised and the, the way people raised you, it plays a part in your life for, for the rest of your life, you know? So a lot of time we face certain trauma and everything else that goes on with, no matter how people look at it and said, man, just move on. Like when I went in the military, the mother was adapt and overcome. Yo, he wasn't there, figure it out, move on. Men shouldn't show emotion, just brush it off and move on. You can't be soft, you can't be a sissy. You can't, these are the things that I've always heard for my life. So we tend to like push it aside, but deep down it affects us. All of us, no matter how we we, we act like we're big and tough, in the back of our mind, it, it resonates and know that that man could have been there for us and he wasn't. That man could have guided us through a lot of things, me being a father also, but he didn't. And he just didn't. I, funny enough, I remember I didn't speak to him in a couple of years. Um, and other family members were trying to get me to like reach out to him and I said no. And because for so two years I never spoke to him. And it was, never forget, it was New Year, it was 2000, New Year's Day 2000. And I said, you know what, it's a new year, new century, you know, new, so, okay, fine, I'm going to reach out. And as I called him and the conversation was kind of just very, you know, not going in any direction, just, hi, how you doing? Long silence on the phone. And then he just asked, so how are your sons doing? And I said, they were fine. And at the time, my youngest son had to take him to the doctor because he was really sick one night. And he just yelled on the phone. And I said, I had to do that. He said, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to do. You're his father. And I, I took the phone from my head. I was like, what? Like, really? Right, right. I, I was shocked that he said that. I was, I was totally shocked. And I was like, hold up. Did you do that for me when I was a child? And he right. hung up the phone on me. Wow. Wow. You know, it, it was just crazy. So so let's talk about how you deal with your children now, right? Um, yeah. I, I know that when you had your child, your child, your first child, I think, um, you held your son before your wife did or before the woman that birthed your, yes. your, your child. And you yes, yes, vowed, the wife at the time. Right. And you vowed that you would never be to your child the way your dad was with you. Absolutely. And to this day, I still remember, that's like 30 years ago, I still remember to this day how how that went. Because I remember when he was born and the doctor gave me and I held him and I said, God, I will never, ever let my son think of me the way my, I thought of my father. And, I, and to this day, I still remember that because I know that if I had that much resentment in my heart towards him, I couldn't believe my son have the same resentment towards me. That would really kill me. I would be like, man, that would be so devastating. And, I, and that alone drove me to make sure that I was there for my sons. No matter what it was, you know, I'm there. And even my daughter that I have now, she's four years old and she's, she's gonna be a woman. So I've had all sons. So now I have a daughter to raise from all the way through womanhood. And it's so funny. Everybody says the girls are the one that takes care of their dads. You know, boys are good in that sense of, you know, you raise them to become men. But girls become women. They take care of their fathers. Because that special bond between a father and a daughter is so special. So I make sure I'm one of the things I'm I'm always there. I have an open line, open communication with my my children, that they always know that no matter what, I'm always there for them. No matter what time, I'm there as a support system to make sure that I'm there. 
to help them through whatever it is they have. Now, um, this is a little bit off topic, but I want to try to see if there's any correlation. Um, you said the last four year years of your dad's life, you took care of him. Were you yes, present yes. when he when he passed? Yes, I was. Um, because he had an accident. Because where I live, he because he had dementia, and he we had dinner. Funny enough, we never really had dinner together because he always wanted he want to eat like at four o'clock. He, he's like regimented like that. So I normally, but I would sit with him, but I wouldn't really eat. Right. That night he had the accent. We all, my wife and I and my daughter, we all sat on the table and, and had dinner together. That, that the, Ironically, I don't even, it just happened. It's, I, I don't even remember that ever happening, that we all sat down and had dinner that night. And then he had the accident. But I was there at the hospital the whole time. And until he basically passed away. Now, when he passed away, what did you feel at that moment? And what do you feel now? Before the, before the turmoil that was going on, because I vowed, I said I would never go to his funeral. I had so much resentment for him. And when he passed away, it, it shook me. It, I was like, Damn, it, it, it's a fake. I was like, I wasn't like bawling, but I was like, it was very emotional in the sense of, man, my father's gone. You know, I have no more parents living, you know? So it 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 got me emotionally. So even though I thought that would never happen, it did, you know? And now, right now thinking about it, I'm like, the one thing I say, I said, I wish, he had had a better relationship with me when I was much younger, you know? So I never, I lost out on all that time because I remember when I cursed him out, when my older brother passed away and I said to him, did you ever see one of my school reports? Did you ever know what I did from, I was in the elementary school all the way to high school. Did you even know anything I did? Do you know? And I, and he was just looking at me, looking at me cause he, he had no clue. When I told him like, I even when I played soccer, he was like, "You did." I just, I just shit my head because I'm like, "You didn't even take time to find out what the things I like to do or anything." So it was just there were bitter moments, but when he passed, I was like, "You know what? It's I, I'm cleansed it from my heart, so I have no ill will." You know what? It's trying to move on and not perpetuate the cycle that other men, other fathers, other black fathers can understand that, you know. They can see the thing that I did and what I endured and not go down that same road and not make the same mistakes and end up being better parents for their own children and stuff. So we talked a lot about our own experiences with our father and which is the reason that led you to write this book, Prove Him Wrong. But this thing has so many different meanings and it's going to help so many people, including myself. Because as you say, you know, sometimes trauma is trauma. And once something is, is there, it's there. And it's hard to extract it as much as you try. Like you, I'm very yeah. conscious of it. And I don't, I don't deny it at all. I know it's there. But that fight, and it is a fight to um, speak to that fight. Because I, I know... Um, what my fight is, but this is not about me. It's about you and your book. So, so talk about that fight, that internal thing that you deal with. It's it's a constant, like I said, it's a constant fight for survival. It's a constant struggle because, again, I never knew the impact or the lack of impact my father had on me until he passed away because the same way... I live my life in the sense of he's not there. He's just background noise. I don't even worry about him because he was never there. You can't miss something you never had. Because those are the things that people always say to you. You can't miss something you never had or he was never there. You just So that whole void, it's it has to be filled by something else or someone else. So that's why when we lack a father figure in our lives, that space gets taken up by... A, another a thug 
or a gangster or a drug dealer or whatever it is. But that 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 space gets taken up and then you start behaving in that manner, whatever it is, good or bad. So, but we never really think it affects us. So we because I never thought it did. I never because I always tell people I hate my father. I said I would never go to his funeral to get him. And I just I was really lash out because prior to him living with me the last four years of his life, anytime anybody mentions him, I get really angry. I said, what the hell are you asking me about? You said, you want to go, go find out? I get really mad. And they were like, hey, why are you so mad about it? I said, why are you at? I get really very, very defensive, very defensive about it. I used to be so angry. And then I realized, writing the book made me realize that, you know what? That's one of the reasons why I was so angry. Because in the sense of that space, that void was never filled and I was seeking something and it never came. And it, it was just one of those things. Subconsciously, we as especially black men, we don't think about these things. We don't. Well, we can go on and on and on because I have stuff that we could talk about, man. But ultimately, this is about the business of Prove Them Wrong, the book. Yeah. Tell us. Yeah, Prove Them Wrong. Yeah. Prove Them Wrong. That, that's it. So put that up again so we can make sure that people see it, make sure that they get it, and tell us how we can get it, um, how we can stay in contact with you, and you know all those social media things that people need to know to, to communicate with you. Yeah, the book is available on Amazon. You can go on Amazon, type in Prove Them Wrong, and it comes up. Um, you can go on my website, anchorminot.com. All my social media handles are the same thing at Drew Minot, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, Snapchat, everything is Drew Minot. And basically, every, anybody want to contact me, reach out to me, talk to me, I'm open. So you can even DM me if you reach out to my website and send me a message, you know, I can reach back. Someone actually wrote a review for the book and they said they bought the book by mistake. It, they thought it was a book they needed for school. And after they read it, they realized how the impact, because they're also of Caribbean descent, and they realized how their impact of their relationship with their father also. And they, the person went on to say that, now that they read the book, um, I'm family to her now. I was really, it was really touching. I was like, wow, I didn't understand that impact. I Because I just was telling my story. Right, I didn't right. know the impact it would have had on other people's lives. Well, again, immediately, I saw the impact for me. And um, it's, it's, it's an amazing, amazing book that you're doing. The project's amazing. And the reason why you wrote it is amazing. Yeah, it's not yeah. like some authors that write books because it's a trendy topic or it's something that they don't really know about. You know about this firsthand. And it's... Um, yeah. And I know you do because just the way we shared this concept, you only would know that feeling unless you've been through it. So I get yeah. it. I get it. So Andrew, it's, it's been real, man. I'm definitely going to push this on all of our platforms. And again, Appreciate it. we need, I, I think this needs to be in schools because if, if something like this was available, available to me when I was in school, I could have had a better understanding of what I was dealing with. And then it could have saved me 30 or 40 years worth of aggravation and pain and anguish, just having a way to understand it. But, you know, now it's here. You're going to fill that void that we were talking about. Your book will certainly do that. I appreciate that. That was very humbling that you would actually say that, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, again, we appreciate you and we'll definitely be in touch. And and I'm not even going to say good luck. I'm just going to say I need to come back. You need to come back when you at the million copy, which is going to be soon. <laughs> from, from your mouth to God is, man. <laughs> All right, brother. Thank be well. you. Thank you.